Right. Good morning, Claire. Hi, Claire de la Luna. Andrano, que se deja. Oh, you're wearing lipstick. <laughs> My lipstick is getting staying in the house. Yeah. <laughs> They're peeling off. Hi, uh, and everybody, this is Rusty Browder. You may know her from the Senior Center. She's joining us today. Hi. Hi. So we have, why don't we go around and introduce yourselves a little bit. Claire? I am Western. I enjoy this class very much. I'm learning a lot, but it's my poor hands. I can't do very much. Hmm. Oh. So we all do what we can. Uh, Leah? Hey, shalom. Manishma. Akol b'seder. I'm new to this, um, to quilting. I've never done quilting. I always thought quilting didn't look challenging. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm finding out it's very challenging and I love challenges and Joyce is the best teacher and I hope to start to contribute in the future. Good. So Leah may, has made a lot of math, so she says more than she likes to admit. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah. <laughs> Betty? Um, to Betty Lowe from Brighton. Rusty, I'm the one that picked up... Um, the material that you left for me on the porch. So ah. I made tons of masks, you know, with that material. I was able to donate it to a daycare center and then there's a, a shelter, you know, here in Brighton. And so, you know, thank you for your contributions. Mm -hmm. And you know what, quilting is a challenge, Leah. <laughs> Betty's the one who did the stars for the stack of my quilt. I don't know if you've seen that one yet, Rusty. Mm. Um, Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have to add one more thing. Joyce, if I ever, I know you don't like compliments because I, you're very humble. <laughs> I should learn from you. But if it wasn't for Joyce, y'all, I wouldn't be so turned on about quilting. And I wish that I could have you for every subject in school when I was little. <laughs> <laughs> I put some slides together to talk about sort of an introduction to um, Bargello to get us get our feet wet here. So this is a piece of Bargello, the original stuff, and this is needlepoint. So you can see you go over one or two um, holes in your needlepoint canvas, and you just line them up like that, and then the design moves. So you follow one color and you see how you're changing your stitches. So the first piece of Bargello I ever did was needlepoint like this. And it's based on um, some old chairs that were found in the museum in Florence. It's called the Bargello Palace, the Palazzo um, Bargello. So here's some uh, diagrams of what those are looking like. So again, you follow one design and you can see they've got different colors of green. So it's also a way of blending colors and creating movement. It's right. the hallmarks of this um, design strategy. And what you do is, first of all, you create what they call a strata. And strata is a word that comes actually from a geology. This is a strata in real life. And see how these layers of sedimentation create these stripes? So that's what's called a strata in geology. So we create a strata in fabric by putting stripes together. And you can use all one tone, you know, any combination that you want in order to make your strata. And then we're gonna cut that up and create movement. Oh, wow. So you, you slice that and then you move it. So you see the purple would have gone up here, but since that's the end of your work, you put the purple down at the bottom. So you have to move one, uh, one or more patches in order to help the design move. The colors are so beautiful. Mm. Lovely. So that's the principle, and, but 
it's it's not an easy technique you know when you were talking about is it challenging this is challenging for me too so you know in every piece that you do there's some little point of challenge uh, that you need to work on and i wanted you to start with a small piece so i made this piece to show you that you can do it fairly simply um ricky Timms is a designer he's also a musician and he has a number of things on the internet. So you can, you can see videos by Ricky Timms on YouTube. And this is a really nice book. If you're interested in the technique, once you've seen it, I do recommend this book. He has his own stories in it. And he has a lot of good hints about blending colors and creating the movements. You can see he has more interesting movements here in this piece um that's on even on the cover so the principles we're going to talk about today are blending the colors creating movement and showing your own creativity and the techniques that are important are accurate cutting consistent seams matching points and pressing so using your iron in this technique is also an important tool. And that's Carmelo speaking of. Yeah, Carmelo, you want to go outside and just sit in the hallway? Just sit in the hallway and see what's going on. So I'm, uh, by the way, the reason I'm not muting her is that she would need to unmute it. And I know she doesn't know how to unmute it. So I'm not going to worry about it too much. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so I, I went through and tried to find four fabrics that I'd like to blend together. And there's just a couple of trials here. You can see you could do almost anything. And it could have a decided pattern to it or not. This is the one I decided to work with because I like the way the yellows and the purples sort of work toward each other. That's very suffragist, actually. Wow. <laughs> So they start off by cutting a uh, uh, cutting square. And he right. says cut squares that are like 18 to 22 inches, which would be, you could get those out of a fat quarter. Um, I had this really nice piece of material, but the, the biggest piece I had was nine and a half inches wide. So we'll call it nine and a half inches wide. There's no particular rules to this. Okay? Um, so I use this as my sizing base and made nine and a half inch squares of each of these fabrics. And the first thing you do is you assemble them into two pairs and they tend to uh, work nicely. For your first piece, I'd recommend you do something like this. Make a light one and a dark one and then the opposite in the other side. So I have dark light and light dark. Okay, so we've got these two columns, if you will, of fabric. And then we're going to slice them. And what Ricky suggests is you start with one, one and a half, two, two and a half. And, and then just make sure that your last piece is bigger than the previous piece. So in this case, with my nine and a half inches, I did one, one and a half, two. And then I realized that if I did two and a half, this was going to be smaller. So I made this two and a quarter. And this was sort of two and a half. So whatever it, but you you want a gradation of widths and you see i've got a mirror image on the other side one two the one and a half here two here see what we're doing i wonder where she's going so we're just going to split them up now comes the interesting part we're going to start blending them and the way he recommends blending them is to take the skinny one and move it over between these two widest ones on the other side. And we're going to continue to do that. Take this one, put it between these, take the next one, put it in between here and the widest one and so forth till it looks like this. Okay, so we're already blending them together. And now we're going to start putting those strips together. So remember I said, every time you put two pieces together, you look for the critical 
match point. So what's the critical match point? If we took, take these two pieces and put them together, what's our critical match point? Where, where they join? Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't matter if these ends don't line up exactly, that's not a big deal because we can trim those later. But this is the one that's going to be highly visible. So we're going to match the, the yes. movement. Mm -hmm. we'll put our first pin here to guide us in keeping it together and then put a few more pins down each side so that you know exactly where to start. And then you want to sew a very nice even seam. See how nice and even that seam is? Okay. Is that going to be a quilt? Yep. Well, it's going to be a small piece. It, it won't cover a bed or anything, but yes, it's going to be a, a small decorative quilt. And so here you can see I've got this nice even seam. And in order to do that, I use my foot with a guard on it, like I've been encouraging you to use at the center. So I have a foot with a little guard on the side so that I can just keep my material up against that little fence. And I will always have a consistent seam. Okay. Is that cotton material, Joyce? Yes, it's all 100% cotton. So now when you're making a strata, you want to make sure that it's going to come out as a perfect rectangle or a perfect square. So keeping it, keeping every strip consistent is important. So here I am with my consistent seam and now I'm pressing it you notice I've got the right sides together and I'm pressing it this way. Why? Because it helps to set the thread into the fabric better. So it, it's a trick for Margello in this kind of piecing. You what do you mean by, way. what do you mean by this way? You're pressing it this way. Well, you've got, you can see my picture. You can see yeah. the iron traveling down. You see the two right sides are together. I haven't opened it up yet. Okay. I haven't opened it up yet. I'm pressing the thread into the fabric first. And now I'm going to open it up and press it flat open. Okay. okay. And it, it just helps to seat the thread better so that the piece stays rectangular. But you're not worried about the underneath seam. You're not opening it. It's just whichever way it goes underneath. Yes, in quilting, we put both of those edges to one side. You know, in dressmaking, they teach you to, to open the seam yeah. up, not in quilting. And the reason for that is then once you, when you're going back and you're zigzagging and making your quilting on top of that, you're actually strengthening the seam. If it was hot, ironed open, then there's a potential for that seam to open up. Oh. Okay, so it actually strengthens the piece if they're both, both of those raw edges are going in one direction. Okay, so here's our critical match point right there. We want to make sure that this lines up exactly. And then we're going to sew eat one strip at a time matching that point. And then I bring it back to the board. So these are all together. I lay it down so I can see the whole of it. Then I'm gonna take this piece and turn it back on top of my, the sewn together pieces. Now I know exactly where that's gonna go. I can pick it up and work on it. But it's very easy to get yourself going wrong if you don't come back and visualize it as a whole piece. So we're going to alternate those strips. Now we have our first strata, and now we get to do it again. Okay, so this is all sewn together, and we've matched that line in the middle. So now notice that the back is all nicely pressed. There it seems going in the same direction. Okay, so you want to keep it nice and flat as you go. And now we're going to take out that seam so that we'll have two columns again, like we did before. But now they're right. So then why do you put in the seam? Uh, to keep our pieces together. Oh, right. Okay. 
So we're going to take that little seam out. So now we have the two pieces and we're going to start slicing like that. Just like we did before with the gradations that we did before on the left side and reverse that on the right side. Ah, oh, you're making a big mishmash. And now we mm. wash it together, yes. And we so we did the same thing I did before. I take the left ones and put them in, in between the ones on the right. So now we've got it all mixed together. And oh. now we get to put this together. Oh my gosh. And now notice we've got a lot more of these critical match points. So whenever you make a Bartello, this is the really challenging part. You need to make sure all of these seams are gonna line up perfectly together. So again, like this, you're gonna go through and match those seams, every single one of them like this. So you have this seam needs to come together. You want these edges to be going in opposite directions this is to keep the bulk of it down. You want to keep it as flat as possible. If you had both of these going the same direction, you'd have six layers of fabric at that point, right? So this way, by turning them in different directions, you have three here and three here, and that's much better. It's going to lie flatter. It's going to be easier to sew across it. So I line up the seams, even back here. I usually start about an inch and a half down and make sure that my seams are right on top of each other. And then at the, when you come to, toward the edge, I pinch the seam and put a pin in it and feel it with your thumb. Some of you have done this with it in the center, so you know what I mean. But I, I feel it. Use that thumb and forefinger together and feel that seam. So if you feel a ridge, then maybe they're too close together because they should sort of nest together very well. So you have the, the, um, the seam allowances of this one going to the left, the seam allowances of the top one going to the right, and you sh they should nest together right on that little valley in between. Um, it, so if you feel a ridge, maybe too close together, and if you feel a little gap, then they're too far apart. So I find it most successful to do that by feel. Mm. You can see that this, this is a little bit too far apart and you can, you can actually feel that with the thumb. How large is that stitch? What number is it on? Uh, well, different machines number differently. This is about a two and a half um, centimeter. No, two and a half millimeters, sorry. Would that be about a 12 um, on my uh, machine? <laughs> if, you, if your number sounds like 12 or in that vicinity, it means 12 stitches to the inch. I usually use more like 10 to the inch. Mm. On European machines, they're usually numbered two or three, somewhere in that vicinity. So you want to keep those seam allowances going in the right directions. Remember one one way and the other one the other way. You can see these top ones are coming toward us. So the bottom one should be going north. And so mm. what I'm doing is using my seam ripper as a, just as a kind of stylus to sort of sweep under it before my needle gets there and make sure that that guy's going in the right direction. So that way you don't have to fix them later. You just make sure that they're fixed before you sew them. So you haven't, you have ironed them or you already? Well, I ironed them before, you know, when we uh -huh. did the strata, we ironed it. Right. Um, and so they're all nice and flat, but, yeah. um, but here I'm just sweeping it and making sure it's going in the right direction. Yeah. Okay. So as you add each strip, you want to, check the joints by feel, pin the seam, guide the joint through under your needle very carefully, press it flat and then press it open and then add the next strip. And these are the basic skills that you need for any Bargello and for many other patterns in quilting too. Whenever you have two seams coming together, this is what you need to do to make sure they line up correctly. Wow.
This is a challenge, all right. So here's your finished piece. And it looks you can, like a checkerboard. Yeah, it does look a little like a checkerboard. And of course, you can make a checkerboard. We made it variable distances, but they don't have to be. It could be the, all the same distances. But these are the critical match points. And you can see if they were off, we would notice, right? So that that's why they're critical, is that you're going to notice these. And if you don't get them right, you're going to want to take it out and do it again. <laughs> yeah, the other thing I want you to notice about this is this piece is pretty darn square. It was out about, it was off by about an eighth of an inch, which was, I was saying, whoa, that was wonderful. You know, um, and that's why I want you to start by practicing on a smallish piece like this. Because that's the test. That's the acid test. Is it square? Did it run cockeyed? And the things that'll make it run cockeyed are if you stretch the material, or if you um, uh, don't have consistent seams. Because if your seams are not consistent here, you can see that that will go cockeyed pretty fast. Wow. Mm -hmm. I do for a binding around. Well, this is what I did. Oh. Oh. You, wow. you, you, you know, ours is not going to look like that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 you'll, be, mine. you'll be surprised. This is actually pretty simple, Barjello, because you can imagine if you're making a queen size quilt and, you know, just moving the fabric like we saw in those original ones. That's a ton of match points to do, and you'll lose patience with it. So that's why I say start with a little one. Make sure that you've got the basic skills down mm -hmm. pat, the consistent seam, the pressing. Uh, do that with a little piece, and you'll be very happy with it. If you start out with a queen size quilt, you're going to be swearing at it, and you'll probably never finish it. <laughs> <laughs> So if the uh, pieces are all more similar, those are the easier ones, right? When the pieces are um, almost the same size? Uh, they, we started out with four nine and a half inch squares of fabric. That's what I did in the beginning. I had made a nine and a half inch square of this one and this one and this one and where's my other one? Uh, this one, this was the other one. And this is the one that all I had was nine and a half inches square. So I said, fine, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so just use practice piece, whatever you want to do and, and play with it. I mean, you can have an animal print as one of them or anything, you know, they just, just start with a couple of scraps and see how it comes out. Um, you have to kind of play with it and discover it. You have to make it appealing to the eye. Yeah, yeah. Like, like uh, you may love like your first one. On a cake. Your first one. Yeah, I mean, especially when you're doing something like this where you're not quite sure how it's going to turn out until it turns no, out. You know? I love the color. So you start with any old thing, and you may hate it, you may love it, but it's I mean, two hours worth of work, so big deal, right? And if you want to throw it away, it's not a big deal. But at least you will have learned something. You'll have learned how to match those points, how to do the pressing, how to keep it square. That's what you're trying to aim for right now. It's just getting those basic skills down. Would you consider this color uh, yellow or gold? Uh, it's so a little of both. Yeah, it's uh, you can see it's got yellow and orange and it aims to oh. gold. Yeah, it is. Um, but I, I like the way these these colors complement each other. So as we blend it together, it's kind of interesting. And I thought I would show with the frame, I showed that this, this quadrant is sort of dominant yellow and this quadrant is more dominant purple. I didn't have enough of the, this is the one I would have chosen, but I didn't have enough of it. So this is it. So anyway, so you just play with it. Well, it's actually fall colors with a little sky blue in there that we've had lately. That's right. Right. It's very nice. I I like it so. Maybe. So so you start off with four 
You set it off with four squares and, and because your material was nine and a half inches. So, but if I was gonna start, so what would I, what size would I start to make a 12 inch square? Um, I don't think I can calculate that quite well enough. But, oh no, that's, that's okay. Know, just, was... just for starters, I would start with something smallish. It doesn't have to be enormous and it can okay. be whatever, whatever sort of scraps you have around that you want to play with. It, okay. could, it could be even four inch squares for all that. A okay. lot less cutting and matching, but at least you get a, a feel for how you're blending the colors. Oh, okay. All how right. They're, how they're going to work together once you start doing it. I'll show you a couple of other samples that other people have done that I thought were pretty. So here's one. And I think this was cut from one um, hand dyed piece of fabric. Oh, wow. So four different patches of it so that in one area it was more red and another area it was more blue. But this is, I think, four patches of one um, hand dyed piece of fabric. Ricky Tim mm. did a lot of hand dyeing himself. Here's another one. Wow. Wow. You can see this very dominant yellow color, this very dominant blue, here's red, red orange, and here's a pure red. So that's a really interesting blend, also. Oh, this one has oh, fabric wow. with a dominant swirl to it. So when she sliced it, you can see how it just kind of opened it up or it almost made it look like it's behind a, a grid, a window grid. Wow. Looks like spin art. Yeah. Yeah, but this, uh, Joyce, this looks more challenging because she was able to keep the main patterns of like uh, swell tide, the tide swell, you know? Right, but remember this was one piece of fabric and she sliced it. Wow. Okay, so this and this were adjacent to one another and oh. she sliced it and put this other in, intervening piece in between. Oh, wow. So it, it, that does keep the pattern consistent. So you can see if you had an animal print or something or else underneath it, uh. yeah. Oh, yeah. Try, try something no bigger than a baby quilt. When you now picture yourself assembling this strata and moving it and reassembling it, and you can see you've got a lot more of these critical match points. Okay. My favorite. So, and I have made two queen size quilts. No, <laughs> three, three queen size quilts and one and two twins. Oh, with four challenge. So I know where I may speak. So, <laughs> so be sure you're ready for this experience is all I'm saying. You know, start with a small piece so that you practice and you're fairly sure that you know how to do this. You all know the Israeli, the famous Israeli artist Agam, A-G-A-M? No, I don't. I think they stole from his art. Look up A-G-A-M. Yeah. Okay, I will in a second. So here are a couple of other quilts. I love this one. Um, yeah. Isn't that pretty? Wow. It reminds me of the ocean. Yeah. Yes. The color blend and the movement. The, those are the hallmarks of our <laughs> It's a beautiful technique. I love doing it, but it is it's not for the you know unprepared. You know. You need to practice your basics before you tackle one of these. This is one of my pieces. Whoa. Whoa. It looks like candles. Mm. Mm. Because the top look like flames. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. like that? Yeah. Wow, Claire, you're right. It also looks like a forest. Like, how do you decide how far you're going to um, move each 
strip like to make the pattern well you usually move it just one notch at a time um you so move you it one pattern one once at a time yeah but you see if i follow the red ones you can see how it moves yeah it's like 3d yes and then uh now all these narrow ones are a different uh, strata so here i've got if I just follow one color in the in the purple, no, I'm sorry, I'm following it's following the wrong one. So here it's this one. All these narrow ones are a different motion, but they're all separated by one movement, right? Yeah. See, and then it goes up one and up one and off the page and then like that. Mm -hmm. So they're just moving against each other as waves do, you know? So it's creating that motion. So this was a challenge that I challenged myself to do, not an easy one. And you wind up hanging these on the wall, you know, like I would pin them up on my design wall to make sure I've got it right before I start sewing them together. So um, you, and you have to move one. If you want this to go up, see this square would have been off the page. So I took this square and put it at the bottom of this line. So you're moving pieces as you go as well. And then you, uh, what I do is I take masking tape, put a little bit of masking tape and number them. So this is number one, number two, number three, number four make sure I know what I'm doing before I start sewing them together. Otherwise, you wind up unsewing them and doing it again. You're putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. But I'm going to, honestly, I'm going to try it with the fabric you gave me a month ago or something like that. Okay. Yeah, start with the Ricky Tim because it, it's much simpler. There are fewer pieces to deal with. And once you are co more confident of your skills, then you can get a book the there are beautiful books out there um that last one is a design from um uh beth ann what's beth ann's last name it's called um uh i think i forget Bl blended bargellos or something like that um but there, there are a lot of wonderful books look on the internet look around um uh, if you want i can give you uh some more Hints. Anybody have any questions you wanted to raise? I guess I have a question about critical points. Is the decision at the beginning to establish what your critical point is um, the same decision? Would everybody make the same decision about the piece? In other, is there only one critical point in a given piece, or could you decide to have a different point, a different aspect be your critical point? Does my question make sense? Yeah, I think so. So, uh, yeah, it, when you, whenever you look at something that you're going to join together, you say to yourself, when I finish this, once it's together, is there some place along here that I care more about that if I don't get it lined up exactly, I'm going to be so upset, I'll probably want to take it apart. So, okay. um, for example, when you're adding a border piece, and you've measured it, you've measured, measured the border piece you're going to put on and you, you've measured your basic piece, like when you're adding the sides on a quilt. At that point, the most important points are the ends because it's supposed to be exactly the same, right? So if it's not exactly the same, if it doesn't meet at the left end and at the right end both, then your your quilt's going to go off kilter. It's not going to be a rectangle. All right, so I start pinning at the ends when I'm putting that border piece on. So I, I say left end, right end. Then I put a pin in the middle. I, I actually fold them, find the middle part, make sure that the middle points are exactly the same. And then I go in and split the difference and get it all lined up. So I know that my 15-inch side and my 15 inch border strip are 
exactly in the right place. That's that one. If you have a point like we did when we were joining the strips originally, we had one point in the middle that if it's not in the right place, that we're gonna have a problem later on. So that's the first pin I put in is that middle point. Mm. Okay, so yes, every piece is different. You just look at it and say, what do I care about the most? And okay. in that case, I care most about that seam in the middle is gonna look great. So when you're putting a Bartella together, every one of these points matters, right? Because they hit you in the face, right? You're going to see that if this is cockeyed, you will notice. So every one of these points becomes important. And when you're putting it together, sometimes maybe this blue is a teensy bit longer than the white one. Doesn't matter. That point, I care most about that point. I'm going to make sure that point matches. Even if I have to like ease this a little bit together, that point matters. So it, it becomes a little feat of engineering to make sure that that works. Mm. Because one fabric might be a little more stretchy than the other one, whatever. Yeah. But that point is what matters. And they, they can be absolutely gorgeous, but it, it does take work. So start small, practice your skills, graduate to a big one. Wow. But that mirage piece was one of my challenges to myself was, to, you know, are you really ready to tackle a big quilt? That was basically what I was saying to myself. How many of you are, are going to actually sew one of these? This one or the first one? This or the, the star one that we, we had also. His Texas dark quilts. And um, in particular, um, Janet wanted to make one that's 60 degrees, the six pointed star instead of an eight pointed star. And basically you do the same thing, but just with a different angle to it. So here's the six pointed star. Mm. <clears throat> so instead of a 45 degree angle, you're working with a 60 degree angle, but it's the same basic principle. You have these different fabrics that work together. So don't cut it yet. Uh, I'll have to make up the directions for you. And I'll send them to you during the week if you wanna start cutting it or if you wanna cut it after class, it's also fine too. Yeah, I might make an attempt to make a small square by Jello, but um. okay. I wanted to show you a jelly rolls. You you know real jelly rolls. This is a quilting fabric configuration. Um, often uh, shops will put them together, or manufacturers will put them together. Like here, you can see this is a package from Moda fabrics that has different fabrics that they put out, but they complement each other. And so there'll be two inch strips or two and a half inch strips on a, on a big roll like that, that you can get together and they, they blend together nicely. So one, one way to get different fabrics that work together is to get a jelly roll can almost put them together and, and do a quilt, a very heavy quilt. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So you just kind of pick the one that appeals to you. Here's a pretty floral one. But um, that's an easy way to find fabrics that work together. Oh. And especially if you're ordering over the internet, if, you, if you're not actually going to the store, it's one way you can make sure that they're going to work together. The other thing to do is to get some fat quarters. If you do go to the store and you don't want to get too much, you can get a fat quarter. Everybody know what a fat quarter is? No. No. Okay, so 
yardage is usually how wide? Uh, the width Four, of 45 inches is usually about 44, 45 inches. Oh. So, uh, so what they do uh, is they cut strips to make the jelly roll. They're, they're 45 inches by whatever the width is, usually two and a half inches by 45 inches wide, the width of the fabric. So when I say WOF on my slides, I, that stands for width of fabric, which is about 44, 45 inches. Okay, so in, if you're gonna do a, a quarter of a yard, a yard is how much? 36 inches. 36 inches. So a quarter of a yard would be? Eight. No, uh, nine times four is 36, nine. Right, it would be nine inches by 45. So, and nine inches wide is not terribly useful in clothing, right? And so it, it's gonna constrain your choices of how you cut it. So what they do is they cut it in half. 36 divided by two is 18. So you get 18 inches wide and then you turn it and cut it in half the other way and you get 22 by 18. So 22 by 18 is what's called a fat quarter. It's not nine inches wide, it's 18 inches wide, but it's only 22 inches long, okay? So you can get a fat quarter, you can usually get them for like $2 a piece, something like that. So four fat quarters would make a good first piece. So, oh, here's an interesting one. This was made with a jelly roll. Wow. Oh, that's beautiful. That's almost like Pascal. Yes. Like paler colors of, of the true color. Beautiful. Right, so you, you choose a, a fat quarter that appeals to you. Just beautiful, it's so nice. If you want it plain. They have all kinds of jelly rolls, so. And these are all sold at uh, Joann's? Yes, Joann's and lots of other places too. So, uh, but Joann's is a great place to look and there's one in Natick. Uh, there's the, the fabric place basement in, also in Natick, uh, near the big Sears out there. Um, the fabric place basement is a great place to look. Uh, there's also a thing called the fabric corner, which is in Arlington. Oh, and, very pretty. And there's Ryco trim that you've heard me talk about before. They're in Providence, but they do sell things over the internet uh, as well as Joanne's does. I order things from Ryco a lot. Here's another Jello Roll quilt. Oh, lovely. Wow. So, and because it's all pre cut to two and a half inches, a lot of your cutting's already done. And what they've done here is just string even different pieces together. These are pieces. Here's one piece, here's another piece. See what I mean? So, they've just strung them together, but because they're complementary, they work. So, they are really neat, very pretty. Yeah. It shows you a variety of different things. You can stay with one tone or you can go more mixed than that. Anyway, just to let you know what's available. That's helpful, thank you. And this is a, a set of fat quarters. Well, I hope you will try one and uh, try Ricky Tim and uh, have some fun with it. Okay. Love you all. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. You Bye. too. Bye. Thanks again. Sure. Thank you. So much.